All right, now we are really getting uh, into all the stories in the books of in the book of Judges. Chapter four is completely dedicated to this one story. Actually, chapter four and five, we're going to see revolves around this one event that happens here with um, Deborah and Barak and Sisera, the captain of the host, and. We're going to jump right into this here. There's a, there's a few topics that come up here that I want to teach on. So let's dig in. Verse number one, the Bible says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And we saw the, the passage last week in chapter three of Ehud. Who, you know, children of Israel now have already gone back and forth between serving God and, and backsliding. Serving God and, and backsliding. Now, it's happened a couple times, and this is the third time now. They're backslidden again. They're off worshiping other gods. So God always is bringing judgment upon them when they uh, steer away from serving the Lord. And it's always, it's always happening when there is no strong leader in place. When there's no one to lead the children of Israel in the right way, in a godly way, this is what we're doing. Soon afterwards, they end up falling back. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And again, we're kind of seeing this continued, like it, it's getting worse and worse for the children of Israel. Now this guy so he has 900 chariots, and it's kind of hard to put that in perspective today as far as like a military goes. But the fact that it's, it's pointing out that there's 900 chariots of iron showed that they had a lot of resources. They had a great, strong army with, you know, and, and chariots were one of the, the weapons of warfare, of modes of, of, of warfare that was going to be, it's harder to fight against, right? You got a guy up on a chariot with horses is a lot more formidable of an opponent than just some guys on the ground with swords and spears or whatever. Uh, it's, 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 like, it's like foot soldiers against a tank, right? I mean, it's a similar scenario. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but you know what I mean here. So he's got 900 of them, large army. They're fighting against them. Now, what's really interesting about this, keep your place here. Flip back, if you would, to Joshua chapter 11. There's a really, really interesting thing regarding this king and this place. Jabin, king of Canaan, is what it says here in Judges chapter 4, and he reigned in Hazor. Look at Joshua chapter number 11, verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and the king of Shimron, and the king of Aksaph. Jump down to verse number nine. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hawked their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them that there was not any left to breathe. And he burnt Hazor with fire. Obviously, these are two different kings. But it's in the same place because there's been a long time space, probably been close to 100 years since the events that have happened here with Joshua now to these new events arising with Jabin. And I don't know. I mean, there's no way of knowing exactly for sure how long it's been. But, but we could probably guess after looking at some of the other things that have happened, they've been in bondage here for 20 years with this guy you know, 18 years and another eight years or whatever, you know, you start adding up all these different time frames. And then they had people in between judging them for 40 years or whatever, you know, you, you, could, you could add up some of those. It's going to be probably a little over 100 years in between. But how interesting is that? Is that the, na the, the name of the king and the place is exactly the same? And I think one of the things that we could learn about this is that even though you may have ancestors that have completely stamped out and dealt with some particular evil, right? I mean, they dealt, Joshua dealt with it. We saw Joshua 11, it's clear. I mean, he, they, they wiped them all out. They destroyed the king. They burnt Hazor with fire. They're like, this is done. 
They took care of it. They wiped it out as they were supposed to, as they should have. Amen. They did it right. But over time, these things that you think are stamped out and gone, they could come right back up again. Now, in Joshua 11, that was a king. He was a king of like Canaan. He was a real powerful king. And what we're seeing here is that this Jabin was also a really powerful king and had the support of all of these other uh, people that were left behind, this remnant that had been left. They rebuilt Hazor they, and they started amassing a great military over a relatively short period of time. I mean, over 100 years is still kind of, I mean, think about over 100 years ago, we're talking about like the 1900s, maybe the early 1900s. You know, so people have been, it, it doesn't really take that long ultimately for people to rebuild. I mean, look at uh, between World War I and World War II wasn't even that much amount of time. But you could look at Germany, you could look at other countries and how much they had been completely, you know, defeated and maybe had the resources drained. It doesn't take that long for these things, for, you know, for countries to come back, but let alone, I think what we can learn from this more, though, is, is the evil, you know, stamping out the evil, not being too, not being too lifted up in the sense that, like, well, that's done, and, you know, I, I'm like this with a lot of things. You know, I want to get stuff done and then just move on to the next. I don't think there's anything wrong with that in general, you know, just taking different things. Okay, I deal with this, deal with this, deal with this, and moving on. But we can't forget about, especially with evil things or sinful things, you know, sins you get the victory over, of just completely ignoring or thinking that I've got no problem with this anymore in my life because it could very easily come back and come back with strength and come back to be another formidable force in your life. And it's, when it comes to things that sins that maybe you've committed, um, you know, it, personally with me, alcohol is a big one. That was a, a big evil in my life. And that's one that I've gotten the victory over. Praise God. I'm glad. You know, thank God that I was able to get that victory, destroyed it, stamped it out. Haven't had one drop since the moment I decided I'm done with this stuff. Praise God for that. But you know what? I can't just have this attitude of thinking like, oh, well, that's all just done and over now. Like as if there's no more temptation or that it can't come back to try to haunt me and, and, to, and to tear me down and destroy me. I'll tell you right now, if, if, if I think that way, I, I, I can never let my guard down against such a, a wicked enemy. And... I think that's one of the things, you know, we see all these, all these similarities between the old king and the new king, and, and both times they were worried about their, their great force that they had. And in Joshua's day, Joshua just obeyed the Lord. Because they had chariots. If you read all of Joshua 11, you're going to see they had, they had a lot of similarities, and it was a big force, and, and God just said, nope, go out and fight them. I'm with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defeat I'm going to go before you and defeat your enemies for you. Joshua went full faith. All right, we're going to do that. Now we see a similar situation here, except Barak is the one who's confronted. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but um, ultimately Barak's the one who's, who's being told, hey, God's told you now, go. He's going to deliver this enemy in your hand. Even though you're scared, even though they have 900 chariots and, and whatever else, and you know, it's a real formidable foe, and he's just kind of like, well, okay, well, but you need to come with me, says the Deborah. You know, he, need, he needs that little extra strength. But I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's just keep going here through Judges chapter 4. Because I'm already starting to get ahead of myself. Look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. Now, there's two parts of this verse that I'm going to kind of pick apart. We're going to look at um, what we should learn from the Bible about these things. One, we see a prophetess, and two, we see that she judged Israel. And we're going to go through both of these things. I don't have a problem with Deborah being a prophetess, but we need to have a, a biblical and scriptural understanding of what a prophetess even is and what it's not. So we're going to look at some scripture about this. And I also just, we need to mention this, just because we see a record of people Doing something in the Bible does not mean that it's always the right thing or an endorsement of that action being done. Just, just remember that. I mean, you read people doing all kinds of things. We, we write about Abraham in Genesis. You know, 
taking his handmaid and having a child with her. That's a story that happened, and those events are all recorded in the Scripture. But just because Abraham did them doesn't make it right. That was sinful. It was wicked. It was wrong for him to do those things. It's wrong to have multiple wives. It's, it's wrong to do a lot of things that people have done in the Bible. So just keep that in mind. The first part, though, Deborah being a prophetess, there are other mentions of prophetesses in Scripture, and they're almost all good references. There's one, there's a, in Revelation, there's a reference to Jezebel, who, who is, is called a prophetess. And then there's, um, there's one other reference that's not a good reference. But for the majority of times, you got Miriam, you have Hulda, and you have Anna. And Anna is one of the prophetesses in the New Testament. These are all godly women. These are all people who, who love the Lord, who serve the Lord. And they were known as being prophetesses. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Now, the reason why I don't have any problem with this is because, see, a lot of people will look at this and say, oh, see, well, Deborah was a prophetess and Miriam was a prophetess. So why do you have a problem with women preachers or women pastors, female pastors? Because that's not what a prophetess is. If somebody prophesies, and see, we have to get a biblical context for these things. A prophecy isn't always just referring to a future event, although oftentimes it is. But just saying, if I were to tell someone, hey, if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell when you die. That's a prophecy. It's a fact. It's a fact of Scripture. It's the Word of God. And that's a prophecy of a future event. So anyone that gives that warning from Scripture, from the Word of the Lord, is prophesying. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 17, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This was at the day of Pentecost, and he's, saying, he's basically explaining what's happening. Why do you see people speaking with other tongues and all this pro prophesying that's going on, this preaching, all the souls that were saved? Why? Because he's quoting the Old Testament, he's quoting the book of Joel, and he's saying, hey, this is what the scripture says, that in the last days, your, your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Because that was what was happening. There's nothing wrong with women prophesying. It says in verse 18, And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. When you understand prophesying is literally just you're, you're preaching the word of God. Now, the, the capacity in which you do so, if you're a man or a woman, there are limitations on that. There are restrictions on that. But just the act of prophesying in general is open to both men and women. And God pours out His Spirit on men and women to prophesy. If God's pouring out His Spirit for that happen, I think we can safely say that is of God. That God is endorsing of that to pour out His Holy Spirit on women to prophesy. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think, you know, in some churches they get so, you know, skewed or, or too far off on an extreme, you know, when they see in the scripture about women pastors, and we're going to get there in a minute. Turn to Acts chapter 21 real quick of basically not allowing women to even go soul winning or do anything like that. And that's not right. Because I think men and women, I think everybody, man, woman, boy, girl should be doing some level of soul winning, doing, preaching the gospel to every creature as best they can in their, in their, um, their context and in, in their life, whatever their abilities are. Look at Acts 21, verse number 8. The Bible says, The next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Amen. It sounds like Philip was, was raising his children right. He was an evangelist. What does that mean? He was going out and preaching the gospel. That was his job. He was ordained to go out and preach the gospel to people. And guess what? His household, he had four daughters. 
They were virgins, raising his kids right, and you know what it says they did? They all prophesied. They all were able to preach the gospel. They all were able to do this. It doesn't mean they were leading churches. It doesn't mean they were getting up in church and teaching the people. Because if you turn to 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to see what the scripture says about that. We have very, very clear. Now, if we had no other statements in the Bible other than these ones, then I wouldn't have any problem with a, a woman being a pastor. I wouldn't have a problem with, with other, you know, women filling other roles in church or in life or, you know, anywhere. If that's all we had to go on. But that's not all we have to go on. We have the entire Word of God. So everything needs to fit in its proper place. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And look, this isn't just for the New Testament. This is New Testament and Old Testament. You, can, you know, There's plenty of other scriptures that will support what I'm going to teach. And it's interesting, too, when, when I had that interview last week, one of the things that came up was um, our belief and our thoughts on gender roles, the difference between men and women, and what men should be doing and what women should be doing, and just the very old-fashioned biblical teaching of men working and women guiding the house, like very basic stuff. Of course, today that sounds real extreme. So that came up, and one of the questions was like, well, what do you do, you know, what do, you do if you have a, you know, a woman that was your boss or something in the workplace or something? I'm like, what do you mean, what would I do? <laughs> I'm not, not going to like fire her if she's my boss. I mean, what, do you, what are you going to do? Right? I said, well, if I have that much of a problem with it, I'll go and get another job somewhere else. I mean, it's not right. Just because, just because I, I preach something isn't right from Scripture, doesn't mean that I have any authority over some, what some random woman does with her life. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to tell you what God says. And people at church, I'm going to tell you what God says, because that's why you come here to hear the word of God. I don't just go and tell everyone else how to live their lives out in the world. I mean, especially if people aren't saved, like what, what good is that going to do? So I don't know where he's going with that question. It doesn't matter where he's going with that question. But I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, our job isn't to just go and tell every single person what they have to do with their life. But when I'm preaching the Bible, I'm going to preach the whole thing. And the Bible is very clear on, on the difference between men and women. Nature is very clear on that also, by the way. I mean, just the way that, that you look and sound and talk and walk and the strength that you have and just about everything about men and women are different other than the fact that you have the same organs in general. You still don't even have all the same organs, but I mean you have a heart, lungs, fingers, toes, right? But even many of that looks different. Okay, so there's, there's, there, this shouldn't be so complicated, yet people want to make it complicated today. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, because 1 Corinthians 14 is a chapter that tells us that everything needs to be decent, done decently and in order. Look at verse number 34. The Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. I've heard critics and people who want to just make the scripture say something it doesn't, We'll use that last phrase where it says, as also saith the law. They say, oh, well, the only reason that they weren't allowed to speak is because it was against the law for them to do so. Right. No. Actually, if you read the verse and what it says, it says that it's not permitted for women to speak in church. They must keep silence. It says, oh, in addition to that, that's also what the law says. Right. There are two things in place. The law and what God was ordaining, what, what the Apostle Paul here is stating, what needs to happen in the church. But the reason why people will even go to those extremes is just because they don't like what it says. See, when people don't like what the Bible says, they're going to come up with any reason they can to try to tell you why it doesn't mean what it actually says. When, when my children that have reading comprehension, they don't have a problem understanding what a verse like that means. And no one really should have a problem understanding what it means unless you don't want it to mean what it says. I don't see how you could get any more clear than that either. I mean, there's no wiggle room. Let your women keep silence in the 
Churches. It says, where are they supposed to, where? In churches. What are they supposed to do? Silence. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, if there's permission being given, doesn't that mean there's a subjection and there's an authority? Absolutely. They are commanded to be under obedience, as also say the law. Look at verse 35. And if they will learn anything, this also gives indication of what time is this happening within the churches. It's during the learning time. We let women sing the praises in the congregation, in the church, with everybody. It's permitted for women to use their voices and sing during the singing time. It's permitted for women to speak when we're just going over housekeeping stuff with, with, our, with our announcements and just kind of going over just some general things, fun things, whatever we got going on. But when it comes time to teaching, and when it comes time for the learning, that's when it's time for women to keep silence in the churches. It says, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, I also believe this verse completely as well. Ladies, wives, if there's something you don't understand from Scripture, don't ask me. Ask your husband. He's your spiritual leader in all things. If your husband doesn't have an answer and he wants to come and talk to me, great. But you should be going to your husband first. That's what, that's what the Bible teaches. Look, if you're going to learn anything, let, their, let, them, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's a shame for women to speak in the church. And look at verse 36 and 37. It says, What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And this is where he just hammers it home. This is a doctrine that people are gonna, might have a hard time with, right? And all these religious people and these spiritual people... <gasps> How could you say that? What do you mean? Women aren't allowed to speak. Oh, you male chauvinist pig. I can't believe you. Out of the mouths of pastors and teachers and leaders within religions. And the Apostle Paul just, just he, he nails it and says, look, you think you're spiritual? You think you're a prophet? If you think those things, then you better acknowledge that what I'm writing on you right now, these are the commandments of the Lord. Because I've even heard people say, oh, that's just the Apostle Paul. Oh, that's just, that's just their culture at the time, and that's just what the Apostle Paul thought. And he said, no, it's not just his opinion. He's saying, if you think you're spiritual, you better recognize this is of God. Amen. This is God's word, not his. Amen. Validating that he, you know, he himself even realized this is the word of God that's been delivered unto him that he's writing unto the church. It's pretty powerful. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to see another reference. It's not even just in 1 Corinthians 14. It's not just the church at Corinth that he's telling you got to keep your women silent because they had some problem with the women there. No, it wasn't specific to them. It's the word of God. And it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And I'm not going to get into all that, but we already see how the Bible is describing how women ought to adorn themselves, which means what they put on, which shows that, yes, God does care how you appear. Now, he cares more about the inside, which is why he's saying, like, you know, the way that you look on the outside should basically reflect what's on the inside. Which becometh women professing godliness with good works. That's how you should adorn yourself. 
Because if you're professing godliness, then show your godliness. If, that's, if you're godly on the inside, then let it show on the outside. Let your good works adorn you. Don't worry about bringing all this attention to yourself with immodest apparel of, of flashy things and everybody look at me and painting yourself up and putting all these jewels and gems and flashy things on you to draw eyes on you. That's not being modest. Just as much as, as wearing almost nothing is immodest and drawing eyes on you. They're both immodest. So don't think it's just the short, short, short skirts and the, and the low-cut tops that are immodest. Those are immodest. But it's also the other flashy things that are going to bring attention to you are also immodest. But anyways, I don't want to get off on that subject. We're going to preach on that. Look at verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Isn't that interesting? We see the same exact context even as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's the learning time. And you know what? When it's come for the learning time, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. That's why in churches you might hear men saying amen during the preaching when it's good. They're validating and putting their stamp of approval and saying, I agree with that. That's right. Amen. And there's nothing wrong with men doing that. And I think it's actually a really good thing of saying, yeah, I believe that. I believe that too. And when you get more people in the church and you've got a pastor that says something that might be controversial in the day and age we live in, if you get a visitor that comes in and they hear these things and they're like, wow, I never heard anything like this before. And the pastor says something that sounds to the world is going to be real extreme. But then you got a bunch of guys going, amen. Yeah, that's right. Preach it, brother. Amen. That's going to show that, hey, this guy isn't just some wingnut all by himself. At least, and they might think that we're all nuts, but they're not just going to be like, oh, it's just, it's just that guy. Right? Don't leave me hanging, guys, up here. If you believe what's being preached, go ahead and say a hearty amen. But on the same side, women are not allowed to, to put their stamp of approval and just you know, shout off and say amen. Why? Because they're supposed to learn in silence with all subjection, because it's not permitted unto women to speak. Verse 12, but I suffer not, suffer just means allow, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So these are the reasons why, one, I don't believe that just because someone's called a prophetess, it means that they were pastoring a church, which the Bible says that, that you know, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop, therefore, must be blameless, the husband of one wife. It's impossible for a woman to be the husband of one wife. It's impossible. I don't care what, what today's world wants to tell you about using words that don't apply to women. And you have two women that want to get married and one's a husband. One's a, they're not a husband. You can't be a husband unless you're a man. That's just, that's just a fact. And I, I don't care whether you accept that or not. That's just, that is a fact. And if you deny that, then you're off in your own world somewhere and, and there's nothing I can do for you. <laughs> you got you to at least get, get those facts straight before I could even try to help you. But most people who have a problem with that are reprobate anyway, so there's nothing you could do. Um, So, yeah, I mean, being a prophetess, it lines up with all the scriptures we saw about prophesying, about women prophesying, makes perfect sense. Preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God. Preach the word of God to your children at home, in your realm of authority, in your realm where, where, where it's totally permitted and not disallowed from God for your realm of influence. The older women, likewise, they teach the younger women to, to love their husbands, to love their wives. To be good, discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Those are areas, too, where you can prophesy unto other women in those areas about being a godly woman. That's what it's about. It's not about teaching all manner of doctrine. It's, it all has to do with how you're a good wife and a mother. God made men to be the leaders. God made men with the attributes of being a strong leader, not women. Women have different characteristics that are equally as valuable, they're just different. 
So these prophetesses, I have no problem with Deborah being a prophetess. I think that's great. I think she loved the Lord. She obviously got the word of the Lord. God was with Deborah. There's no denying that. I think that's great. But one of the problems that I see here is that I don't think she should have been judging Israel. And I don't fault Deborah for this. I don't. We'll get into that. But, but one of the things that we see happen is she judged Israel. Now, in, in 1 Timothy 2.12 there, it says, But I suffer not a woman to teach. It says, Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So when you have a woman, at least in this instance, in this context, starting to teach, she is usurping the authority over the man. The man's the one who's supposed to be teaching, not the woman. Just as much as I believe that, and turn if you go to Isaiah chapter 3, just as much as I believe that women shouldn't be leaders, whether it be, you know, judges, presidents, you know, political offices, I don't think it's right for them to hold those positions of authority and power because all throughout Scripture you're going to find that God has given authority to the man over the woman in general, okay? Everything has its scope and its purpose. But the way that God made men and women different is, uh, is pretty obvious. And we see in Isaiah chapter 3, in verse number 12, that it is literally a curse when women are ruling over a nation. Thus saith the Holy Ghost Amen. in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. So it's describing a people that have children uh, being the oppressors. Over adults, over, over older people, and the women are ruling over the people. And then look what it says, the rest of that verse. Oh, my people, they which lead thee. Now, who are they which lead thee? Well, it looks like it's the women ruling over them. They which lead thee cause thee to err. Err means to be in error, to be wrong, and destroy the way of thy paths. Women weren't meant to lead. And you can read the whole chapter in context and see that this, you know, there's, there's cursing be, you know, on, on these people, on, on, on God's people, as for my people. And he's describing children are their oppressors, women rule over them. That's not a good thing. Women weren't meant to be rulers. Now, this situation was not ideal here with Deborah. However, God did use Deborah, and she did speak the word of the Lord. Now, um, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And she sent and called Barak. Well, let's read. I don't know if we read verse number 5. Let's reread verse number 5 if we didn't read already. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. She even knew that Barak should have been the one that was judging. That's why she's going to him. But he was too much of a pansy to step up to the plate and to do the job. He had no spine. He was not willing to take over his responsibility and do his job as a man. He had to rely on a woman for his strength. Look, God made men to be strong. That's why he gave men the bodies to be strong, but not just strong physically, emotionally as well. Men ought to be able to make the tough choices and not be all emotional over things. Usually it's the women that are the ones getting upset and getting crying and you know, going through all these emotions during difficult times. The man is designed to be strong. And if you're going to be a good man, a good husband, a good leader, a good father, you need to be strong. That's part of the job. Barak wasn't cutting it. That's not Deborah's fault. 
That's not the children of Israel's fault. That's Barak's fault. God had a job for Barak. And Barak was, was stepping down from, from being in that full position that he ought to have been in. And he was looking to Deborah instead of looking to God in what he should be doing. Deborah had to tell him. He's like, verse 6, says, and she sent and called Barak out of Kedish. Now, I mean, he's already you know, somewhere else and said, hey, hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded? Like, didn't God already tell you? Go and draw toward Mount Zion. He's like, go and bring, these, you know, bring Naphtali and, and, and Zebulun with you. And God's going to deliver the people for you. You're going to win. Didn't he already tell you that? Like, what, what are you doing over there? She's got to stir him up because, look, if she doesn't do it, someone's got to do it. He's obviously not doing it. Verse number eight, it says, And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. He's relying on her to be the strength. Now, man, don't put your wife in this position. When there's a void of authority, of power, of structure, that void's going to need to be filled for things to keep moving forward. For families to go in the right direction, someone needs to step to the plate and do the job of being in charge. And unfortunately today, we have too many pansy men not willing to step up and take responsibility and take charge of their household and say, this is what we're doing as a family. And instead, just go, oh, I don't know, I don't care. Oh, what do you think, honey? Here, why don't you just decide? Why don't you just make all the decisions? Here, why don't you take care of all our finances? Why don't you make all the decisions for our family? Why don't you, I don't know what we should do with anything. I don't even know what we should have to eat. Let's just go ahead and whatever you say is fine. You know what? The, a woman naturally, she's going to want a strong leader at home. As much as women today might want to deny it and say, no, I don't want that. I want to be my own will. Deep down inside, the Bible says, with Adam and Eve, it says, thy desire shall be unto him. And that's the way that God made women. And that's a fact. You deny it all you want, but, uh, but every woman wants to have a strong man to lead. But the problem comes in when the man isn't being strong and they're not leading and someone needs to do it. And the woman's just like, well, someone's got to do this, so I'm going to step in. And I think that's what Deborah did. Someone needed to lead the children of Israel and the man that was supposed to be doing it wasn't doing it. And I would say, man, don't put women in that position. She shouldn't have been the judge. She shouldn't be usurping authority. But you know what? Barak should have been the one going... You could stay home because God said he's with me. I don't need you to go with me. I need the Lord to go with me. Men need to learn how to be decisive and be strong. And that is one of the key things that we can learn from this. That's why it said, you know, I had no problem with her being a prophetess. That's great. You can preach the word of the Lord. She's not pastoring a church. She's not the priestess, right? Nowhere does it say that. She was a prophetess. But she was the judge of Israel, and, and I don't think she should have been. And people want to turn to, to women of the Bible who are great. Well, look, God can use women very mightily. God does use women mightily. This isn't a sermon against women. There's nothing against Women doing what God has for them with their life. That's, that's you know, everything that's according to God's will. We love, uh, I want women to do. But I don't want women to do things that God didn't make them for and didn't intend for them to do. Same thing with men. We all should be doing what God has for us to do. But you could look at, at situations like with Esther and with Ruth and with Mary and other women in the Bible. Hey, they're all great godly women and praise God for them. But just because God used women doesn't mean he wants them to be the ones in charge and running the show. It's that simple. Just as much as God can use women, God can use women more than men to get people saved, which is probably one of the best, you know, biggest sources of rewards in heaven. How many people you can lead to Christ? That's like, like 
as far as I could tell, and from my reading of scripture, that's like the best thing you can do. There's, there's other things you can do, but I mean, changing the, the fate of someone from going to, to hell to going to heaven and, and putting their trust on Jesus Christ. How do you get better than that? And everybody can do that. So when you get to heaven, you could have, there's going to be pastors of churches that are saved that go to heaven. That don't go out soul winning. That don't do a lot of things. But they were a pastor of a church. And they're going to get practically nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. Right. And there's going to be some humble women that kept their head down, that a meek and quiet spirit that didn't get any of the glory or the attention or the recognition, but they did what was right. And day after day, year after year went, they did their, in all their capacity, preached the gospel, led people to the Lord, and they're going to be rewarded immensely. Amen. This isn't a sermon against women. And especially think about women that raise their children to be soul winners and to do great things because they spend so much time with them to love the Lord with all their heart. You know, dads, you ought to be doing the same thing, but women have more influence over the kids just by the sheer amount of time they're going to be spending with them more than, more than the dads. And that's a fact. You know, dads need to do everything you can to raise your kids right, but at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're, the, the woman is a help meet for the man. You can't do everything on your own. You have to, you have to rely on, on your wife to do it. And that's a huge job that women have. It's a huge job. People think that, that we're down on women or something, or people will say, oh, you don't have a job? If anyone ever says that about my wife, <laughs> like, don't say that to her, first of all. But don't say that to me either, because she does have a job. She has a very difficult job. Every wife, every mother has a very difficult job. It's not easy to raise the kids and to keep everyone fed and to keep the house going right and to do all that stuff. It's not an easy job at all. I have to step in every once in a while when she gets sick. And not just when she gets sick, but when she gets so sick she can't move, which doesn't happen very often. Because she has such a tough job, she still works when she's sick. See, when men get sick, you get sick days, you could call off, and then you, get, you lay in bed, and you're like, oh, man, I think I'm going to die, and you've got like a cold. <laughs> and you get away with that. But moms can't do that. Because if they try to do that, you're going to have, Mom, 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 Mom. Can I play with this? Mom, 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 I'm hungry. And that's what's going to happen. It's not an easy job. So this, isn't, this, is, this has nothing to do with being against women, but it's, it's doing what God has for us to do. Look at verse number 9. Even, and, and again, we see, we see, I think Deborah is a very godly woman. Very godly woman. Look at verse number nine. She says, and she said, I will surely go with you. So she says, okay, I'm going to go with you. Why? Because she wants the victory to happen. So she's going to do what she, you know, if, if he's not going to go unless I go with him, fine, I'll go with you. She says, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. So Barak's probably thinking like, well, whatever, because I'm giving you all the honor anyways. But she wasn't talking about herself. But even the way that she said it, she said, you know what? The honor that should have gone to you is going to go to a woman. And she's saying it in a way that it doesn't belong to go, you know, it shouldn't go to a woman. But because of your actions, it is going to go to a woman. That's a shame on Barak for the honor and the glory that he should have received for leading the children of Israel into battle and winning and having a great victory. It's a shame on him to have this woman end up getting the, you know, the final victory over Sisera. Sisera was a mighty captain of the host. 
He, he was that great general. He was that great leader of the army. You know, that, that powerhouse that was, that was withstanding the children of Israel and oppressing them. Let's keep reading here in verse number 10. Now we're going to see the story of, um, of Jael. It says, And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zaanaim, which is by Kedesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. Now, what we're seeing here is that this Heber, the Kenite, um, he was of the, the, the household of Moses' father-in-law. Like that's the Kenites were uh, Moses' father-in-law's descendants, his family. And Heber was this guy. It says, basically, it says that these Kenites, they showed Sisera. They basically informed Sisera and said, hey, the children of Israel over here. So Sisera was able to prepare himself to battle against them. And the reason why I'm bringing this up and why the Bible is bringing this up is because the woman that betrays Sisera is of the Kenites. So even though the Kenites in general, they're the ones giving the, feeding the information to Sisera, that's why when Sisera gets there, he feels comfortable and totally at ease and he's saying, you know, hide me or whatever. He's, he's going in there for refuge because he totally trusts her and she ends up doing the right thing and kills him. Uh, let's keep reading here. It says in... Um, Verse 13, And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Herosheth of the Gentiles on the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in the which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went, and look, she's the one giving the command. Like, okay, Barak, now's the time. Now you need to go. Like, like she's sending him off to school with his lunch bag. Don't forget, I cut the crusts off your sandwich for you, Barak. I know you don't like those. I cut it in half for you, too. I cut it into square, into rectangles, or into, into triangles for you. I know that's the way you like it, Barak. Here you go. So Barak went down from, ta from Mount Tabor with, and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted, lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Herosheth of the Gentiles, and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So Sisera runs away. Sisera turns into a sissy and he runs away. He gets off his chariot and he takes off. All the rest of the chariots, so though, they're, they're all fleeing and retreating. And Barak's going with the whole army and just, just wiping them all out. He, he leaves Sisera to go run away and, and chases after the rest of the army. And it says that they destroy all of them. And it says here that they went all the way unto Herosheth of the Gentiles, which is where Sisera lived and where he was from, basically all the way to, to his hometown. So they're, they're, they're chasing him all the way back. And, uh, and that's this great victory that God is giving into the hands of Barak. And it says in verse 17, Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. So she covers him up. She gives him some, you know, a shirt, some clothing to put on over him and it says and he said unto her give me I pray thee a little water to drink for I am thirsty and he's out in this battle or out fighting fighting a war fighting a battle he's, he's tired he's exhausted he's thirsty more than anything and it says and she opened a bottle of milk so he asks for water she gives him milk and gave him drink and covered him again he said unto her stand in the door of the tent and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say is there any man here that thou shalt say no then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a an hammer into her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. So basically, she gives him milk to help him to fall asleep. She walks over there. She's got a stake in his hand. It's 
big old tent stake and she's got a hammer and he's got his head down and she just goes boom and hammers that right through his head. It's pretty brutal. <laughs> But she did, she did it, and, and you know what? That was the right thing to do. Um, Sisera was, a, was you know, this, this captain of the host that was oppressing the children of Israel, and God was delivering them in his hand, and, but he was the main guy. So you know who gets all the credit and the glory for this victory? God, first and foremost, but it's not Barak. It's Jael. Jael took him in. And, and ended up defeating, you know, the head of the army, the top guy. Verse 22, And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. I'm going to go a little bit more into the story next week. In chapter 5, it goes over a lot more. There's this song that um, Deborah and Barak sang, kind of going over this whole victory. So we're going to get a little bit more into detail on that. I just wanted to cover mostly the, the, you know, the role of, of women and, and being prophetess and judging and stuff. That's kind of the, the biggest uh, points I wanted to make because those are the most relevant in, our, in today's society. There's a lot of other things we can learn from this chapter, but I like focusing on the ones that, you know, today's world is most at odds with. These are the battles that we have to fight today that, you know what, in the past, our ancestors, they had this taken care of just fine. The role of men and women. You know, 100, 150 years ago, this wasn't a problem. This really wasn't much of an issue of women being in submission to their husbands and the husbands being strong and leading the house. This wasn't a problem. They, they defeated that enemy. They defeated that Jabin a long time ago. You know what? Jabin's reared his ugly head again. And we're going to fight that battle today because that's the enemy. That's one of the enemies we have today is this perversion of men and women's roles according to the Lord. This perversion of what's right and what's wrong. And we're going to attack it head on and we're going to stamp that out, Lord willing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for teaching us and instructing us in these great stories in the Bible. God, help us to, to learn and to grow stronger and to not be ashamed of your words or of our faith in your words, dear God. I pray that you please help us to boldly proclaim them. Pray that you please help all the men and the women of this church to prophesy, to preach the gospel, to be preachers of your word and to be instant in season and out season, dear Lord. And um, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.